okay. Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And you know that you've been with us, that our navigating the journey is about your respecting your wishes and desires of how you want to choose to live your life from beginning to end. Well, today we are going to talk about measles. Now, when I was a child, everybody had a measles shot. A vaccination. In fact, I still have the scar. And then we thought it was over. We thought that measles had disappeared from the face of the earth. And now it's back because some people don't want to vaccinate their children. So today we're going to talk to Ken Farm, who is a chair of Neighborhood Board 15, Kalihi Palama, about he's been leading the charge to get everybody vaccinated. So, Ken? Um, hi. Hi, Marsha. How are you? I like the shirt. Thank you. I like your shirt. It looks great. Um, tell us about how you got started with this push to get everybody vaccinated, everybody in the schools in Hawaii. Well, you know, I mean, I can't take as in terms of personal, you know, uh, as not necessary responsibility, but ownership over that. I'm just adding to what was already there. Um, you know, one of the things that I try to do and focus on is if there's going to be a public policy that we're going to have to make decisions upon, I think it's very important that we see what the scholarship says in terms of the academic literature and studies before to really uh, have an understanding and cultivate that knowledge based upon what we want to make our decisions based upon. And sometimes, you know, emotional uh, you know, sway can sometimes have an effect on people where they, you know, they're biased toward one way or another. But, you know, if we let the uh, academic literature speak for itself, uh, what the experts have said and what research have, uh, has so far determined, uh, we can see that vaccinations are, is a very safe uh, mechanism toward making sure that there are things that you mentioned before when you were a kid that were pervasive uh, and, and widespreading are no longer a part of this population. Um, and that is one of those things that I think is very important that we need to you know, bring back again. There's some people who really feel strongly that uh, vaccinations are bad and that you know, they, they should, it's, it's a matter of personal choice as opposed to public policy and protecting the community. So I think that that's a very uh, in, uh, distinguishing mark with that. Uh, there's places like in uh, New York and California where they've taken the, uh, the uh, I believe it was the county council, uh, took very strong uh, actions toward making sure that populations got vaccinated, even though it was something that was, uh, you know, regarding their, their religious uh, belief system. Uh, it, but the larger point was protecting the entire population. And I know that's very controversial well, for a lot of people, uh, but that is where we're at right now. Well, speaking of religious preference, um, I understand that certain religions don't believe in vaccination. However, um, it's been proven that they're safe, that they're not going to hurt the child. But do your, does your religion um, have a right to uh, impo impose your religion on my child? That is, if your child does not get vaccinated and all of the other children do, and then you bring in a, a, the measles, well, at what point is your responsibility and the other kids in the class? And I, I guess I'm, I'm stumbling on this, but there, there comes a time when we have to look at the rights of all of the children and not just one. You know, Marsha, I think one of the important parts, too, is we have to obviously separate, you know, what is you know, being done at the public school level and public charter schools as opposed to private schools. 
you know, even places like Kamehameha Schools have, has made sure that uh, the students, you know, that they have under their care are vaccinated. And they have very high rates of vaccination in comparison to other types of private schools and charter schools uh, that are not uh, within those realms uh, uh, of the public school realm. Uh, for the public schools, I'm sorry, as private schools, however, in the public schools, um, that is something where we have a law which dictates that before a student can go to public school that they must be vaccinated. Obviously, there's people who, you know, because of allergies, because of some of the, um, a, uh, I believe it's called, it's an ovian type of thing that is used as part of the vaccinations that uh, they're unable to because they're allergic to eggs. Uh, that's a very small part of the population in comparison to those who it would just uh, more a matter of our religious viewpoints or we'd rather not. And the more that we have those types of cases, the more we lose what's called herd immunity. And that's where people, because we have so many people who are vaccinated, the others who aren't able to be vaccinated are protected. The more that that number is decreased, uh, the greater the chances are that the persons who aren't vaccinated because of those allergies uh, are susceptible to you know, what the vaccinations are protecting from. But I'd also, I'd also like to add, Marsha, that when it comes to vaccinations, you know, nothing is ever, or, or just anything even in medical, it, it, it's nothing that is ever just an absolute proven or it's always going to be 100% safe. There's always a, a, a danger with anything. For example, if someone's having a surgery, uh, there is a danger that there'll be some complications. However, you know, we all have to do that. I mean, when it comes to walking on the street, for example, there's there's a risk of walking on the street. There's a risk of driving in a car. And we weigh those risks in terms of the, out, you know, the outcomes of which we're looking for. And in this case, you know, with parents, uh, parents you know, would hopefully want to do what's best for their kids. Obviously, there's some uh, risk that's involved with vaccinations. But that is the, the, what could happen if you don't vaccinate is far worse. And furthermore, uh, there is less of a chance of things happening uh, if you vaccinate than the alternative. Well, in those big cities where we read about the measles uh, epidemic outbreak, we've, we've been fortunate considering that the state has only tested 30, state, 30 schools out of the hundreds of schools we have. So we've been really fortunate. However, with the transit population, the number of tourists that come every day, how do we know that one of them you know, unintentional, of course, one of them has measles. How do we know that we're protected? Or do we know? Yeah, I think that's a very valid point, Marsha, about asking, you know, how do we know? I don't think we can really know for sure. And I think that question could be addressed to the Department of Health. But I think the other part, too, is what can we do to protect our population here? If we have a transient population, that's going from Hawaii or, you know, you know, as part of tourism or just tra traveling through to the other parts of, uh, of, the, of the continent, uh, that's very different. We can protect our population here and we can do so just like what we did with the TB vaccinations of before. Uh, there were uh, trucks that were going to schools and just and vaccinating uh, students and staff, I believe that was, uh, if you go to, I believe it was uh, Lanakila Health Center, they still have the TB control center. It's over there, you can see the pictures of the old vans as the Department of Health, and they made sure that people were vaccinated uh, to protect them from there. But again, it's, it's the education is there well, for it, and I think that there needs to be more of an outreach to show people, you know, like with anything, there's always a danger. However, there's a greater danger of not having your kids vaccinated, uh, as well as themselves, uh, to what the alternatives could be. Now, when, uh, who pays for the vaccination? If um, the school the law says you have to do it. Who pays for the vaccination? If I take my grandchild, great grand now, to be vaccinated, do I pay for it? Does my insurance pay for it? How does what happens? And when, especially when the state demands that you do this, who pays for that? Well, I think it. You know, every uh, person it depends. So, for example, I would. Uh, suggest that, that that question be deferred to the Department of Health. They have the TB control branch um, because I believe that's one of the things that need to be have, excuse me, before a, a person goes into public school or even working with students. So uh, there is a website, I think that- I, I know can, the law says they have to, the law says you have to accept for medical, for religious reasons. But um, again, since it's mandated, my question is, do we as taxpayers pay for that or does every parent pay for it? That's, that's my question. 
since it is mandated. Marsha, I think like we were it's like seat belts. It's like seat, it's like seat belts. You know, the resistance to seat belts and to helmets, and yet it's proven that they save lives. So, are we at the same place now with with measles? You know, Marsha, just to answer your first question, um, it, I, as mentioned before, it would depend on the coverage that the individual has in their insurance. If somebody, for example, has Quest, I think that that might be covered in comparison to someone who has like a, a PPO or something like that, where there might be a copay. However, that question is better addressed talking to, you know, the person if they're working. I think that would be an HR question that they could ask. Um, but also, you know, referring to the Department of Health, uh, that information is readily available. If you go on to just Google Department of Health Hawaii, um, and vaccinations. I think it'll take you to the TB control branch or, or one of those that can answer that question um, because everyone's circumstances are different. Do you know how it got started that some people are afraid of vaccination? Do you, do you have any clue how that got started? Especially since it had all been but wiped out and now it's back. Do you know, have any clue as to how this fear of vaccination started? Do you have any idea about that? So one of the best examples we have was actually a, an English doctor that uh, wrote a, uh, a study that was in what's called the Lancet. Lancet is one of the most uh, uh, pronounced and, and well-known in the medical uh, industry and sciences. Uh, that if you had a journal that was published there, then it's, you know, you've made a name for yourself. However, this study that was there uh, linked it to autism, and it kind of went from there. I'm sure there were other things, but that was one of the most predominant ones. Uh, the name of that doctor escapes me. Um, I, I believe his name was Andrew. I could be wrong about that, but um, there was a study that was conducted, and it had to be, from then, it had to be retracted. But the, uh, the narrative was out there, and people took that, and, you know, there was a Term in, in research called confirmation bias, so they agreed amongst themselves, and now we're having this issue with that and other things where people are seeing that, you know, this is a, a way of making money for the pharmaceutical industry. I believe that it is making money for them, but I think it's making money to them by the tune of about two to three percent in comparison to everything else that they're doing. So, you know, getting back to the point about what vaccinations and why it's important is because, like you say, with the transit population, and we have students, just like it had in New York, you had one student that was there, and because that student wasn't vaccinated, it affected over 500 persons and students. But do, now back to this autism thing, was it ever proven that it didn't cause autism? What's, you know, we know? In terms of the methodology of the study that I'm aware of, that you know, first off, you cannot infer causality on a correlation. So to say that it was, you know, a correlation, there is a strong relationship. However, it was the way the study was done and what was left in, what was left out. And to my knowledge, as it has been shown, that that study uh, from that doctor uh, was retracted uh, from the Lancet. So, so uh, does that mean infer that, that, the vaccination did not cause autism. Is that? Am I to infer? Uh, to like I said, I think I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to make a causal remark where you're saying that it either it it it, it, it caused it or it didn't cause it. All we can do is have you know the data suggest this and and a strong relationship or not or, or not having a strong relationship. We also have to look at how the study was conducted. So I think that's what the Lancet did in in regards to uh, that individual, uh, that doctor who was as far as I also understand, is no longer a doctor uh, in Britain. I believe that license was uh, revoked. So I think oh, we are getting right. into the weeds about this, but um, I can give you no, other I'm, information as part of that. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, if it was disproved because there's so many children that have autism and uh, is it because we are, the science has gotten so advanced that they're un understanding autism better now than they used to. And it, uh, the children are surviving much better. They're doing all of these things. So my question, I guess, is, is was it ever disproved? Was it ever taken away that no, autism is something totally different? 
that's I guess that's what I'm asking. I think that the other studies that have been therefore conducted has shown that there is little relationship. In fact, there was less of a the the, the relationship from before was a uh, as was suggested by the doctor who published in the Lancet said there was a strong relationship between autism and vaccinations. However, uh, studies that have been conducted now have shown that there is no relationship between or a very small relationship in between. Again, we cannot make causal remarks on a, on a correlation uh, study. So um, that's just how research is. We can't say it proves this or it doesn't prove that. Um, we can say there's a strong relationship. The data suggests this there, you know, based upon the data that was taken. But we can never make a causal, uh, relation, uh, causal type of remark. I, I'm just wondering if I, how I would feel if one of my children or grandchildren uh, had autism. I, I'm, thank God, all of mine are are healthy. But I'm just wondering how I would feel with this question mark. Did this really have something to do with this child being autistic, or is there something else? I, I, that's where I'm coming from. What is there's possibility that autism is called by something else other than vaccinations? And does that mean all vaccinations or just chickenpox? So there's various types uh, of vaccinations, Marsha. Uh, so I think, you know, it's just what I'm trying to do here is just get the outreach that there is information out there that comes from the Department of Health. I know that Dr. Park has done a very good job of trying to get that out. And also, you know, this isn't something that's just for someone to just kind of figure out on their own. There are resources that you can ask that are good and credible. I would recommend people uh, going to the Department of Health website under uh, vaccines and to go for themselves. I know that there are sometimes they try to put on uh, presentations, and I think that they're going to put more of an outreach because of the fact that there is this a strong movement toward not having vaccinated, uh, uh, their uh, parents not having their kids vaccinated. But what does that actually mean uh, from the policy standpoint? So like we were mentioning about herd immunity and really talking about things like that so but that, that people but understand. But you said that before. Mm -hmm. You said that before, herd immunity. Mm -hmm. What is herd immunity? So what herd immunity is, is where you have the larger population that is vaccinated to cover, if you will, for those other individuals who are not able to become vaccinated. So those are those individuals who have, you know, eggs, uh, they're allergic to eggs or any of the other types of, um, types of ingredients that are used in vaccinations. So because of that herd immunity or those people who are vaccinated around them, it protects those individuals. The lower of the population that is being vaccinated, the greater the chance that a herd immunity goes away. Uh, I can't recall the percentage of what is needed required for the population to have for it to be effective in terms of herd immunity. And again, I would defer back to the Department of Health because they have some really good information. And as a parent, if that's something you're concerned with, I would advise you to go to the Department of Health website and uh, talk to somebody from there. And if so, uh, there is Dr. Park, and I'm sure that they'll be willing to give a presentation, to either a neighborhood board or other types of uh, community uh, activity or issue that goes on. So there's a larger amount of people that can ask those questions and, and really have it addressed from a scientific standpoint. Well, when we talked about the herd immunity and you said mentioned one student in New York, well, you think of the millions of people in New York and one person shows up and now they've got an epidemic. So what uh, happened? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So what happened what was happened? With, with New York was there was a school that was a, a, a school, I believe it was a Hasidic Jews that were against vaccination. So the entire student body that was there were not vaccinated. So when the student had contracted, I believe it was um, measles, um, then it, it just went across the entire school because of the fact that every person in the school was not vaccinated. And then it was okay, made. So they, did uh, the, not, they were not they did vaccinated. not have the herd. No, they did not have the herd. Uh, immunity, immunization. Im no, they did not. Okay. No, they did not. Ah, because of that, okay, it just that it, it spread out to the entire school. It's so, spread. right. So, I mean, imagine, you know, as you know, if, if there, there may be, for, for example, I believe the student traveled, uh, I believe it was to Israel or some other place that uh, and then came back home and 
these other students who didn't have vaccinations because it was against their, I guess, religious creed or so. And that's the kind of questions that we're going to have to ask, especially when it comes on a policy side is, does that outweigh protecting the population? And in this case, you know, in New York, and as well as other places in California, they've said that, no, um, we're going to impose heavy fines on the individuals who choose not to. Um, it is a touchy subject. This isn't something that people are going to like saying. But you know, when we look at public policy, public policy is for everyone. And if we can find ways to protect the population, uh, then we must move toward that. And, as long, and also, too, is we have the, uh, the body of evidence to suggest, strong evidence to suggest that, yes, vaccinations, though they do have a very small case of things that could possibly happen, it therefore outweighs other types of things that can happen, such as uh, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella. So, you know, it is therefore encouraged that you do become vaccinated. Well, yes. And I guess that we should be blessed that here in Hawaii, we have the herd uh, immunization. And so feeling fairly protected, given the 10,000 new visitors that arrive every day. Uh, and if you said it only take, took one, uh, then I guess we need to feel fairly comfortable. I think, you, I, I think that, you can feel comfortable, but we shouldn't be complacent. And I think that's something you know, when it, you know, there's, for example, you mentioned the sample about the different schools, right? And so there were only 30 schools that were, in, and I, you know, that in terms of the sample size. Um, but areas like Hawaii, for example, there are large cases of uh, non-vaccination of the students that are going to uh, public charter schools uh, and private schools. And those could become uh, areas and vectors toward uh, people having, you know, contracting uh, measles or whatnot. So those so are the kind of Kauai, questions we have. Kauai. So Kauai yeah. is On the... Kauai. <laughs> Kauai. Kauai is one of the, uh, I hate to say the word purveyors, but one of the, the largest populations that do not have vaccination. And it could be because of some of the people there. It could be the mindset. But that, again, that's why we have to have that information out there and really have that outreach as to why. Marsha, I think you mentioned before, too, that, you know, uh, that people would become vaccinated. And I think there's another part of it where people forgot what it was like before vaccinations or the things that were contracted before. One of the things that come to mind is polio. And, you know, one of the, I've talked to, to older individuals where they were, when they had their kids before, the worst thing that they thought about was, oh my goodness, their kid's going to have polio, you know? Oh, yeah. And, oh, yes. you know, we still have people who are in iron lungs. We don't have that anymore, uh, as far as my understanding is. But there's still people who live in iron lungs. And, that's because they contracted polio. And part of the reason it, they contracted yeah. polio is because they, they didn't have the vaccinations. And uh, yeah, as a child, uh, that was before the polio vaccination. But oh my gosh, uh, the president, FDR had polio and it was a constant reminder of what polio could be. And there were all kinds of stories that you don't go swimming and you don't do this and you don't do that because they didn't know where polio came mm -hmm. from. So uh, today, when we have Dr. Jonas Salt won a Peace Prize for his in discovery of Penicillin. the vaccine. So now that we have all of this data and we have all of this, and we have been in America almost totally free when I was a child, everybody had open cough. They didn't call it open cough. Now it's, uh, they give it a different, a pretty name. But I can remember, oh my gosh, the children suffering so with this cough. It, it, it was, and it was pink when it came up. And it was years before I would do Pepto Bismol because I had this memory of these children and open cough. So we have come so far in protecting our population. It, it troubles me to think that we are regressing. Um, and hopefully that your um, advocacy will make a difference, will keep us protected, let me put it that way. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's advocacy, but it's, it's not in terms of a full-time thing. This is something that I think we just, you know, I strongly believe in because, for example, you're mentioning a place like Kalihi, a very transient population and um you know there's a program for example for hepatitis and getting the vaccine for that um 
that is a statewide program that the state does in order to, especially with different populations coming from areas in the Pacific, uh, that has not had the vaccine and become protected by that. So measures like that are very good about protecting the population that we have. Furthermore, it's, you know, in terms of the science, the science has therefore declared that this is something that is safe. It is safe. In anything, there's always going to be a possibility for a complication. But for the most part, this is a safe way of protecting a person as an individual, their family, because nature always isn't, is not always nice uh, to humans. And as mentioned before, there are many things before, uh, for example, smallpox. Uh, smallpox did, did a number on a population yes. prior before. And then there was, I believe, there was a, a UN directive that basically didn't matter who you are or what you were, they were going to vaccinate every single person on the earth. And I believe that they, uh, they did so uh, with everybody that they could. Um, and for the most part, aside from you know, some laboratories, uh, smallpox uh, has been eradicated. Um, but I can just imagine what it would be like if we would have had the narrative now about how things are unsafe and, and the, the nature of things like smallpox going through our population. So again, uh, it's good to have good information out there. It's good to know uh, information that can be trusted. I encourage people to go to the Department of Health website. And also, if you, you know, they, there's a number they can call as well. To find out the real facts, there's also uh, some flyers there. Again, it's not something where everything is going to be 100% uh, safe. There's, even when it comes to other types of complication, for example, if you take a medication, there are side effects. And that affects a certain amount of the population. So, again, you ask yourself the question, is it something that, you know, will the possible costs outweigh the benefits of something like this? But have the information first. Yeah, now what can we do as ordinary people to assist you in your drive, your advocacy, to get this message out so that people aren't afraid? Because that's fear is terrible. So how do we get rid of the fear so their parents are comfortable with having the children vaccinated? How do we, what do we do? You know, fear is a, is a, is a terrible motivator, yet it is a motivator. I, one of the things that I think that we should do is we should have more of those outreach from the Department of Health to of the communities. And the reason I say that is because um, people will go online and they will read something, they'll Google something, and thought that they've conducted their research. And that's why I say is, you know, it's, it's important to go to these types of uh, things like the Department of Health and ask those questions because from there, uh, that is, you know, our, and in terms of our state, that is where, you know, everything that matter, you know, that comes under the framework of health and safety, uh, it falls under uh, the Department of Health, especially when it comes to, to people's health, as mentioned before. So I think that that is a very a good way of doing it. Um, another way of looking at it too is if somebody's telling you something, don't always believe it. If it's just it came from Google, um, things can be changed. So again, it's where you get your information from. And don't be afraid to ask questions. And you know, even if a person has friends who are not you know, too keen on vaccinating, um, find out the information for yourself, but also uh, seek out good uh, sources of information. When, when making this. So, yeah, so you're the number one source you're saying, well, we could start with the health department. Is that is that what you're saying? I think it would start that with, the, with the health department start. because that's where a lot of the, you know, that's where um, it comes from in terms of vaccinations. So, again, there's Dr. Park, uh, who is a strong advocate for vaccinations far before I was. Um, that looks at this, and also there is, you know, the research for which they use to determine their positions on. And especially in, in what you said, your neighborhood, Kalihi Palama, where you have youngsters, children from everywhere, all the islands in the Pacific, from Asia, the mainland, with all of these different places. I would think that that would be a primary in, in the early schools, early years in school because there's children from every background. Is there, a, is there resistance in your neighborhood or is this just Kauai with the resistance? 
So for my neighborhood, I am not too familiar that there's a, a lot of resistance. I know that there's other there's pockets of resistance in areas uh, uh, on the northern part of the islands. I believe in uh, in the northern portion when it comes to other areas on the uh, north shore as well as in, in the Kailua area and a few other places in between. I don't want to just go out and pick those out. Uh, but I do feel that this is something that we have to. But uh, again, Marsha, first needs to go to Department of Health and, and to make those determinations. Well, Ken, you're always such a wealth of information. My goodness, I am so proud of you and so pleased that you are willing to talk about these things. So uh, we, I think we have to go and you will come back and we'll talk some more. Sure. Oh, great. Thank you so much for being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much, Marsha. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. I love it.